The building blocks of our world are atoms. Air, water, rock, and food are all made of atoms in different combinations. Each type of atom belongs to a certain element, and there are more than 100 elements known to science. Their full diversity is shown by the periodic table, which arranges elements from lightest to heaviest. Today, I'd like to talk about some interesting features of the 20 lightest elements by showing you a model of the atoms that represent them. For a long time, atoms were thought to be the smallest possible objects. The word atom actually means indivisible. We now know that atoms are made of even smaller ingredients. Each one has a solid ball called a nucleus at its core. Let's start our model by finding something round to stand in for a nucleus. Zipping around the nucleus are tiny electrons, which form a sort of shell at the outside edge of an atom. The heavier an element is, the more electrons its corresponding atoms contain. We're going to need up to 20 electrons. Are you hungry yet? The simplest possible atom belongs to the element hydrogen. In our model, it looks like this. There is just one electron, and the nucleus contains just one particle called a proton. In chemistry, we give plenty of attention to electrons because they take part in chemical reactions. Electrons are tiny, fast-moving, and stay on the outside of atoms, where they can interact with other atoms. A chemical reaction is, fundamentally, an exchange of electrons between atoms. By contrast, particles in the nucleus are tucked away and protected. It takes a nuclear reaction to break them apart. From now on, let's just focus on the electrons. They can be arranged in shells, represented by the curved lines in this model. The single electron in a hydrogen atom stays within the first shell, which is closest to the nucleus. At most, the first shell can hold two electrons, which means we still have room for one more. This hole represents a place where an electron could fit, it just isn't there yet. The second lightest element is helium, which looks like this. The first electron shell is now full because there are two electrons present. What does this actually mean? It means the shell is stable. It is happier being full than it is not being full. To put it another way, it is now very difficult to take an electron out of the shell or stick another one in, which would happen in a chemical reaction. In the real world, helium does not take part in chemical reactions for exactly this reason. It is the first of the inert gases. If helium is inert because it has a full electron shell, how does hydrogen behave, since it only has a half-filled shell? Hydrogen is very reactive. It will readily accept an electron from another atom to fill that shell and stabilize itself. This process tends to form larger compounds like water. Alternatively, a hydrogen atom can give away its electron and be left with none. This is also a stable situation. Reacting this with water is how acid is produced. We can now expand our model to build up the first 20 elements on the periodic table. We're going to use the 2882 rule, which goes like this. The first electron shell, closest to the nucleus, can hold two electrons at most. The second shell can hold eight electrons, and the third shell can also hold eight. With the fourth shell, however, only two electrons can fit, so 2882 is the overall pattern. We also need to remember that if the outermost shell is completely full, it is said to be stable, meaning this element will not take part in chemical reactions. An incomplete outer shell is unstable, indicating a reactive element. With these principles, we can not only visualize the first 20 elements, we can predict how they behave. Let's continue on from helium, shall we? Element number 3 is lithium, the metal that is so useful in batteries. It contains one electron in its outermost shell, which can hold a maximum of 8. That means a lithium atom has two options to become stable. It can lose one electron, leaving a full shell of two, or it can gain seven electrons. I think you'll agree that losing one is much easier than gaining seven, so that's what usually happens in nature. Lithium loses electrons very easily, 
and they can be channeled to produce electricity. The next element is beryllium, with a total of four electrons. It needs to lose two of them to become stable, and it can do that by combining with other elements. Certain valuable gemstones contain beryllium in large amounts. They include stunning green emerald. An atom of boron contains five electrons, three of them in the second shell. It is somewhat reactive, and it can be used to make special heat-resistant glass. Next we have a fairly common element you have probably heard of before. This is carbon. Its outermost shell is exactly half full. It can lose four electrons, or gain four electrons with equal ease, and both situations will stabilize it. This gives carbon the ability to take part in a wide range of chemical reactions, and form a staggering variety of compounds. Every fragment of DNA, protein, fat, or sugar in your body relies on carbon combined with other things. It even floats around us as carbon dioxide, or lies locked up in limestone and other rocks. Carbon can even combine with itself to form crystalline materials like graphite or diamond. After carbon comes nitrogen, the most common element in the air we breathe. We are now in the domain of atoms that would rather gain electrons than lose them. Nitrogen can gain three electrons to become stable, or it can lose five of them, and gaining three is more profitable. It can actually gain them from another nitrogen atom, forming a compound called dinitrogen. This is the version that is found in air. Alternatively, it may combine with oxygen and other elements in soil, water, and living things. Nitrogen is another vital ingredient in our bodies, especially within proteins and DNA. You've surely heard of this next element as well. Oxygen is found not only in the air, but also in organic material, soil, rocks, water, and just about everything else. There's no escaping it. The reason oxygen exists inside so many things is because it is highly reactive in a way that allows it to combine with many other elements. It needs to gain two electrons to become stable, and it's actually very good at sticking to other atoms in order to share their outer electrons. The reactivity of oxygen drives many important processes, including combustion, the process of burning. When an object burns, oxygen from the air surrounding it forcibly converts it into new materials. Burning wood, for example, converts it into charcoal, water, and carbon dioxide. Next we have the first of the halogens, which I like to call the vicious elements. Fluorine only needs one electron to stabilize itself, and it's incredibly efficient at tearing that electron from another atom. Luckily for humans, the high reactivity of fluorine means it is unlikely to be found by itself. It will always be chemically bonded to something else, because that is the only way it can remain stable. For instance, compounds containing fluorine are found in our teeth and bones. Harmless fluorine-based salts are added to drinking water in some countries to keep our teeth pearly and white. Finally, we come to another inert gas, an element like helium that is stable by default. This one is called neon, as in neon signs. It has a full outer shell containing eight electrons, and it is very difficult to take any of those electrons away or insert any more. Consequently, neon does not take part in chemical reactions. You may be wondering then how neon signs work. If there is no reaction going on, how is all that light created? This is actually the result of quantum processes. Electricity being passed through the neon sign gives energy to some of the electrons in neon, and they give that energy back in the form of light. Electricity can cause light to be emitted by any element, but in neon the light happens to be visible to humans, and very bright. If you'd like to know more about this phenomenon, look out for videos about quantum physics on my channel. Okay, back to chemistry. So far we have visualized the electron configurations of the first 10 elements. We have also applied the 2882 rule to predict the behavior of each of these elements. For the next 10 we can move a bit quicker because they share very similar properties to those already described. You can see this on the periodic table. Elements arranged in vertical columns have similar properties because they have the same number of electrons in their outermost shell. 
Let's see how this works with the 11th element, sodium. A sodium atom holds just one electron in its outer shell, so it can lose that one electron to become stable. This is the same pattern we saw in lithium, which sits directly above sodium on the periodic table. Sodium is actually so eager to lose an electron that it reacts violently with certain materials like water. The elements below sodium are progressively more explosive. Together they form a group of swimming pool hazards called the alkali metals. Element number 12 is magnesium, which is well known for being soft and flammable. It burns with a stunning white light. Along with beryllium and the elements below it on the periodic table, magnesium forms a group called the alkaline earth metals. They are not as explosively reactive as the alkali metals, but they are still keen to donate electrons, because that is the best way to stabilize themselves. They can be found inside a variety of rocks, bonded with oxygen, carbon, and so on. Next, we should expect something similar in behavior to boron, and that is what we find. The 13th element is aluminium, and unfortunately for you American viewers, we use His Majesty's English in this household. Pure aluminium is a fantastic resource. It's light for a metal, but still decently strong, and beautifully reflective when it's polished. We use it in many products, including vehicles, packaging for food and drinks, and metal roofing. It can even be used in electronics because it conducts electricity nicely. Next, we have silicon, which is similar to carbon because it can gain or lose four electrons to become stable. The versatility of pure silicon has driven the development of computers. It's because of silicon based processes that you're able to watch this video and I was able to create it. Silicon is also happy to react with many other elements to make larger compounds. About 90% of all known minerals contain silicon, so the earth we live on would be very different without it. It's also vital in glass, which is a solid network of silicon and oxygen atoms. Element number 15 is phosphorus, famous for the light it produces when it reacts with oxygen. It used to be the key ingredient in matches until it was replaced with sulfur for safety reasons. This also happens to be another element that is essential for all living things. DNA contains phosphorus, and so does a compound called ATP, which essentially carries energy through living cells. Now sulfur is the next element along, with six electrons in its outermost shell, just like oxygen. Sulfur is not quite as reactive as oxygen, but it does have some uniquely interesting features. Pure sulfur forms yellow crystals, burns with an airy blue flame, and melts into blood red liquid. By changing its physical environment, you can get a whole rainbow out of it. An atom of sulfur needs to gain two electrons to make a full shell of eight, and it can do this by bonding with neighboring sulfur atoms or atoms of some other element. This is yet another common component of rocks and minerals. If a given mineral does not contain oxygen, there's a good chance it contains sulfur instead. Underneath fluorine on the periodic table, the next halogen is called chlorine. This element is not as reactive as fluorine, but pure chlorine is still a nasty substance and toxic to humans. Chlorine and its compounds are also toxic to bacteria, which is why tiny amounts of them are used to disinfect swimming pools. You may be interested to learn that pure chlorine has no smell. The distinctive smell of a swimming pool is caused by other things reacting with the chlorine, stabilizing it and making it safe for us swimmers. Let's move on to the third inert gas, argon. Much like neon, this element responds vividly to electricity being passed through it, but it doesn't take part in chemical reactions. Argon is useful in places where high temperatures are wanted, but not burning. For example, Welding objects that contain carbon would burn the carbon away in an oxygen-rich atmosphere, and that would not be helpful for the welder. Welding in a furnace pumped full of argon removes the risk of burning, because argon does not react in the same combustive way as oxygen. Only two elements to go. Once again, we see an element that has one electron in its outermost shell. It's another alkali metal called potassium, and its behavior is much the same as for sodium. 
Element number 20 is my favourite of them all, calcium. As well as bones, teeth and milk, calcium is also found in seashells and the rock limestone, which is essentially a compressed collection of seashells. This is the element with the electron configuration 2882, but although the outermost electron shell is full, it is not chemically stable. The reasons for this are beyond the level this video is aimed at, but they will be explored in higher level chemistry videos. For now you just need to remember that calcium tends to lose two electrons per atom, bonding with other elements to stabilize itself. The 2882 rule gives its electron configuration, but to predict its behavior you should look at the elements directly above it on the periodic table, beryllium and magnesium. Time for a quick summary. The 2882 rule describes how electrons are arranged in an atom. There are four electron shells, and the first to be filled is the closest to the nucleus, or centre of an atom. It can hold up to two electrons. When the shell is completely full, the whole atom is said to be stable, and it doesn't react with other atoms. If the shell is half full, it can either gain or lose an electron, and it can do this by starting a chemical reaction. The second and third electron shells can hold up to eight electrons each, and the ease of gaining or losing electrons determines how reactive each element is. The 20th element, calcium, has two electrons in its outermost shell, which is full but not stable, because those electrons can still be lost easily. It is only for the first 20 chemical elements that the 2882 rule is useful, but those are the elements you should be able to memorize for high school. That's the end of this presentation. I hope you found it helpful. Best of luck with your studies.